In our unit on reproduction, we learn that during sexual reproduction, a sperm and an egg fuse to form a zygote. But where does the sperm and the egg come from? How does the male and female reproductive system produce these specialized cells with only half of the chromosomes? Well, to understand that, we're going to explore the process of meiosis, which is a type of cell division that produces gametes. Let's start with an overview. Here is our parental cell. This is the original cell that's going to give rise to the gametes. Now this is the simplest cell possible. This cell only has two chromosomes, one homologous pair. So this cell is said to be diploid because it has a pair of chromosomes. Before meiosis can begin, DNA replication must occur. This is important because we have to double the chromosomes so that the gametes get a copy of the genetic information. So now we have our homologous pair of chromosomes, but each chromosome consists of two sister chromatids. So this blue chromosome now consists of two blue sisters, and this red chromosome now consists of two red sisters. You might be tempted to look at this cell and say, hey, now there's four chromosomes, but you would be wrong. There are still only two chromosomes in this cell, but each chromosome consists of two chromatids. And you can tell a chromatid because it's gonna be connected in the center. So now that we've doubled the chromosomes, we're ready for meiosis. The first half of meiosis is called meiosis one. This is a cell division in which the cell divides and one chromosome ends up in one cell and the other chromosome ends up in the other cell. Note that the chromosomes still consist of their sister chromatids. Then these cells are going to divide again. This is called meiosis two. During this cell division, the sister chromatids are pulled apart and separated into different cells. So at the end of meiosis, at the end of both cell divisions, we end up with four haploid gametes. These are haploid because they only have half of the chromosome number compared to the original diploid parent cell. So instead of 2n equals 2, we now have n equals 1. Now we're going to take a closer look at some events that happen during meiosis. And it's not necessary to memorize every single phase and every single event, but there are some key processes that occur. So the very first phase of meiosis is called prophase 1 because it happens during meiosis 1. Here are the sister chromatids uh, from our duplicated chromosomes. Note that during prophase 1, the nuclear envelope is disappearing. Meanwhile, the spindle is forming. The spindle consists of fibers that are going to attach to the chromosomes and pull them apart. Also, you can see centrioles. These are organelles that organize and direct the spindle. And then finally, perhaps the most important thing occurring is that our homologous pairs of chromosomes are sticking together to form groups of four. So here's a homologous pair that is doubled. You can see the sisters. Here's another homologous pair that's doubled. There's the sisters. And here's a third homologous pair that's doubled. And again, here are the sisters. What's key here is that the sisters, the non-sisters, are actually exchanging genetic information during a process called crossing over. Because they're hanging out together, they might swap some genes. And this is going to lead to very uh, unique gametes in the end result of meiosis. After prophase 1 comes metaphase 1. This is pretty simple. What's happening here is that our tetrads are lining up in the middle of the cell, which is known as the metaphase plate. You could think of it as the equator of the cell. Note also that the spindle is attaching to the tetrads, and it attaches at a point called the centromere. This is where the sisters are connected. So now that the spindle is attached, the spindle can pull apart the homologous chromosomes. So here, homologous chromosomes are being pulled to one pole, and here, homologous chromosomes are being pulled to another pole. That happens during anaphase 1. And then finally, meiosis 1 concludes with telophase 1 and cytokinesis. These kind of run together, but basically uh, what we see is that a cleavage furrow is forming as the two cells separate. Cytokinesis is literally the division of the cell. You can also see that the nuclear envelope is starting to reform and the spindle has disappeared. 
All right, so that's meiosis one. We now have two cells, but we're not done yet. We need to go into meiosis two. This is gonna look pretty similar. During prophase two, the spindle forms, the envelope disappears. During metaphase two, our chromosomes, which still consist of their sisters, um, are gonna align in the middle of the cell and the spindle attaches to them. Then during anaphase two, the spindle is gonna pull apart the sisters. One set of sisters goes to one pole, the other set of sisters goes to the other pole. And then finally, during telophase two in cytokinesis, uh, the spindle disappears, the nuclear envelope reforms, and the cell itself splits. And this is where we get our one, two, three, four haploid daughter cells. Note that each of the daughter cells is a little bit unique because of that crossing over process. And that leads us to the final uh, key piece to meiosis. Meiosis contributes to variation in offspring in three key ways. One key way we just looked at, crossing over. Because the non-sisters exchange genetic information, the chromosomes that result are new and different. The second key piece to variation is something called independent assortment, and this happens during metaphase one. Let's say that we've got a cell with two pairs of homologous chromosomes. During metaphase one, when they line up in the middle of the cell, they could line up this way so that the red are on the same side, or they could line up this way so that red and blue are on opposite sides. And what that means is when the cells divide, we're gonna get a different combination of chromosomes. And in our gametes, then we're going to have a very different combination of chromosomes. In this particular situation, the two different blue chromosomes are stuck together, as are the red, but here we've got the red with the blue. And this increases variation because it's a random process. Uh, the chromosomes could align in any direction when they line up at metaphase one. And our final uh, source of variation relates to that. It's called random fertilization. And random fertilization refers to the fact that a parental cell in the female could give rise to many different eggs because of crossing over and independent assortment. Similarly, the parental cell in a male could give rise to many different sperm because of independent assortment and crossing over. And then during fertilization, there's really no way to know which particular egg will combine with which particular sperm. So as a result, there are many, many different zygotes that could be produced by the same man and the same woman, which is why uh, siblings, unless they're identical twins, may share some traits but will not be identical. It's because their mom produced many possible eggs, their dad produced many possible sperm, and it was just luck which one happened to get together during fertilization.